going to begin in the 39th verse. Luke 22, verse 39. Tonight I wanted us to, uh, as we do this study uh, tonight on Gethsemane and the intercession, the agony that our Lord suffered in that place. And so, just as Jesus endured Gethsemane, we, we in a very small way have our own Gethsemane in our own walk with the Lord where we pray and intercede and believe and are in agony maybe over whether it's sin in our life, whether we're trying to, to just get rid of it and we're having to trust Christ in every aspect of our life to, to set us free from a, a, a bondage of some sort, whether it's uh, a perplexing situation, whatever it is, you've probably been in a garden of Gethsemane of your own to an, ex to an extent of, of, of something. So tonight I wanted us to, to look at what our Lord endured, some things that he shared. And of course, as always on our Wednesday nights, if you have any questions or comments, we want this to be an open Bible study discussion. So just jump right in and, and share and the Lord might be putting a question in your heart to say something that someone else wants to also say but doesn't want to say. So the Lord could use you if, if you put something on your heart. Father, we just come to you tonight. We ask for your blessing on your word. We ask that you would give us discernment and wisdom, that you would impart it into our spirit, that you would come as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Teacher, the one that makes everything easy, the one that teaches and allows us to grasp the things that we need to grasp. We ask that you would open up our ears and give us ears to hear. We pray that our hearts would have faith to understand, to believe, to comprehend. And may the enemy, the deceiver of our souls, the one that seeks to pervert the word of God, be bound and put under our feet. We pray, Lord, for a loosing of your spirit. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, and he came out and went as he went, or as he was wont. In other words, that Jesus had a custom uh, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at that place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. So, just real quick, we know that Jesus, in his in the Lord's prayer, he tells us that when we pray. And how we should pray. He says to pray that the Lord would not leave, lead us into temptation. But deliver us from that temptation. To deliver us from the evil that is all around us. In other words, if I try to do anything on my own, I will surely fall. If I attempt to uh, overcome temptation by my own willpower or by my own ability, I will surely find myself sinking in despair. It is only through Jesus Christ, it is only through Him that I have the victory over sin, over death, over the hell, over the devil. It is only in Christ as we abide in Him. John 15, Jesus tells us to abide in the vine. And unless we abide in Him, we have no part with Him. We have no life of our own self. A branch does not have the ability to live outside of its grafting, of its of its um, in joining with the vine, with the root system of that tree. And so, unless we abide in Christ, unless we are, are constantly plugged into Him, we're lost. We won't make it. And so, He says here, pray that you don't enter into temptation. Meaning that this time that Jesus is about to go through, it was like none other. Now, I want to real quick say this. The, and I was talking a little bit Sunday about the Word of Faith movement. The Word of Faith movement has been around a long time, but it has continuously grown in popularity. It has continually, it, frankly, if you turn on Christian television today, for the most part, you're hearing that as the message that they're giving. But part of all what the Word of Faith embodies is that Jesus died spiritually. You will hear and I, you can you don't have to take my word for it. You can get on YouTube and you can find these men saying it word for word out of their own mouth. But I've heard Kenneth Copeland say that 
he himself could die on the cross and accomplish everything that Jesus accomplished. That is blasphemy the utmost. But see, that is rooted in the idea that I am a king's kid and that I am a son of God myself. I am, and they actually will, will portray themselves as gods. And there is an exaltation of man and a, and a, and a, and a bringing down of, of Jesus in that movement. But in it also is that Jesus went into hell, and for three days that he was in hell, he wrestled with Satan. He, he had to gain victory over sin in hell. And ironically, you can't find that in the Bible anywhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it say this, that Jesus went to hell and had to defeat Satan in hell. But the Bible's very clear that when Jesus was on the cross, he was, he was enduring everything that the Old Testament proclaimed the Lamb had to be, and that when Jesus said, it is finished, it was then that the veil was torn in two, when he, the Bible says, we talked a lot about this Sunday, that his body was the veil itself, he entered in once and for all. And so in this doctrine, in this teaching, that Jesus died spiritually, it's all a bunch of hooey. It is all a bunch of baloney, and that if we get caught up in, it will derail us from the truth. It will derail us from what the Bible teaches about the cross of Calvary and the sole source of our victory. Because your victory over Satan, your victory over sin, was not won in the basement of hell somewhere. It was won when Jesus Christ gave himself at the cross. Glory. And, you know, Jesus was, the Bible does tell us that for those three days that he, and it doesn't give us a lot of information on those three days that he was in the tomb. So anybody who puts a lot of additions in there, they're adding to God's word. But it does tell us that he went in and he led captivity captive. Other words, the people of the Old Testament, King David, for example, you can read Hebrews 11, all those men and women of faith. They were on, in paradise, the Bible would say, that they were held in this place. They couldn't gain access directly to God in the sense of heaven as we do today, when to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, because the cross had not yet happened. There had not been that way made yet. But they were not in hell as in, in torment, because the Bible always has, has, has separated the believer from the non-believer. So David was not in hell with Goliath when he died. It, it, it was not, that's not biblical in any way, shape, or form. So in those three days, whatever Jesus did, at some point he went down into that place of holding, and he led all of those Old Testament believers yes. out of that place. He did that in some way, but that's all we know. And to add to it, or to to, to come up with a whole doctrine beyond that is an error. But we know Jesus Christ led captivity captive. Those who were held bondage because the cross had not yet made a way, their faith in believing on that side of the cross kept them from hell. And so Jesus Christ went in and delivered them and set them free. But when Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. It was there that the devil lost his hold on death. Yes. It was there the devil lost his hold on sin. Yes. And what Satan had done in the garden with the first Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, set men free. So what Jesus is doing here in the garden, we got to be clear. There is more here than just physical problems that Jesus knows he's going to be going through. There is a spiritual battle that is going to be raging that we don't probably even have a clue on. Jesus was not the first and he wasn't the last man to die on a cross. He wasn't the first to be tormented and he isn't, wasn't the last to be tormented in such a way. So to think that all of what Jesus is about to go through and the agony he is feeling in Gethsemane is all natural is an error. Because it was far more as he took upon himself the sin of the world. He became our sin offering. And just as under the law, they would lay their hand upon that lamb. And as, for instance, if I was under the law, I would come and I would place my hand on the head of the lamb. And by the virtue of that obedience, my sin was transferred to that lamb. And that innocent lamb was then killed, sacrificed because of my sin. 
But it wasn't a perfect sacrifice because I had to do it continuously. I had to do it, to do it every single year at the Day of Atonement. And as I continued to fall and fail and, and mess up, I had to continually come in and offer up sacrifices accordingly. So it was an imperfect sacrifice. But Jesus was about to enter in once and for all. Yes. And you know the powers of darkness was at work. They were at work against him. And he says here, pray that you enter not into temptation. And he, Jesus, was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and he kneeled down and he prayed. And he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We see here that point of surrenderment. We see here where Jesus is fully aware that not only will he be delivered up in just a few hours, not only will he be betrayed by all of his own disciples, not only will not a single one stand up for him, but he is about to be brutally beaten. He is about to be nailed to a cross, and for six hours he will hang publicly naked for my sin. He knows this, and he knows that it, that's not just the that's just the physical. He knows that there is going to be the agony as sin is placed upon his stead and God looks away. Now we see here, we know from the Bible that everything Jesus did was in perfect will of God. He did not do anything of himself. He clearly stated that everything he did was led by the Father. And so for this moment in time, for the first time ever, the Son of God will have an absence of the Holy or of the Father being with him, as God has to look away. And that's why when Jesus was on that cross, he said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? So all of that was foretold. The scripture foretells that in the Psalms, that word for word the Messiah would say that. When you read Psalm 22, it's called the, the, the Psalm of the Cross. There is so many in that one Psalm of David that Jesus uttered word for word as he fulfilled every single dot and tittle of the law. But as Jesus took upon himself my sin, God had to look away. The agony of that. So I want us to understand here, Gethsemane is more than just Jesus thinking, I'm going to be persecuted physically. He, he, he recognizes the all-out attack against him spiritually. He recognizes that there is going to be the weight of the, of the sin of the world literally placed upon him. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so as that sin was transferred from me to that Lamb, by virtue of my obedience to, to place my hand upon that Lamb, Jesus Christ was that same Lamb of God, that he would bear the sin of the world upon himself. He says here, If there be another way, if it's possible that this cup could be removed from me, Jesus is getting to that place where he is completely surrendering his will to the Father. I want us to keep your spot here in Luke. But let's turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verse 7. It, it speaks of this agony that our Lord was in. It says, so also... Hebrews 5, Hebrews 5, 7. Who in, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So what the, the, the author of Hebrews, which I think is the Apostle Paul, but when, when the author of Hebrews is writing this, he is showing, he is revealing the agony that Jesus went through. Jesus never sinned. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin, meaning that he took upon himself my sin upon him. He, he did not become a sinner. He did not be, become at fault in the sense of he did error, 
but rather he was just as the lamb who was innocent. It did nothing wrong, but yet my sin was transferred to it. It is in that same thing that Christ did the same. He was perfect in every aspect of everything. He was God Almighty in the flesh, and yet God became that lamb. So my sin was transferred to him. And in so doing, the father looked away because God's holy. He can't look upon that sin. And he looked away as Jesus suffered on that cross. He did it for you and I. The agony that Jesus is, is suffering in, in the Garden of Gethsemane is more than agony of just the pain, the natural pain. It is the agony of knowing all that the next hours are going to hold in the spiritual sense of everything that's happening. But praise God, Jesus Christ surrendered to the will of the Father. He surrendered to not my will, but your will be done. And when Jesus got up off of his knees and he settled in his heart, he knew what the will of the Father was. It would read on if you turn back to Luke 22. And I'll stop here in a moment and we can, if you guys have anything you want to share. Uh, to show the agony, you know, it would tell us that his sweat was of great drops of blood. Uh, the agony that Jesus was in, in the grueling turmoil of him knowing what is about to take place. But it says in verse 43, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And that angel from the Lord, we can look even in the, at the beginning of the Lord's ministry in the wilderness when he fasted 40 days uh, and 40 nights. He was, at the end of that, and he, after he endured the temptation of the, of, the, of the devil, angels came and they ministered unto him. So we see that what these angels are doing, they weren't necessarily imputing strength in terms of lifting him, him physically up, but they were... I believe, reminding him of the promise. Because the Bible would tell us that he who knew that God was not going to leave him in the grave, he knew that God was able to raise him from the dead. And in that, I believe these angels strengthened him in reminding and in, and in strength as if the Lord needed reminded, but strengthening him of the promise that the Father will not leave you there. Amen. Amen. The place that... that, that when you do this, when you give your life for the sins of the world, that God is going to fulfill all things that he has promised from the foundation of the world, Peter said. How glorious of a, of a thing. And as we are 2,000 plus years later, as we see where we have come from this point, I believe we are so very quickly approaching the day where our Lord is going to come back again. He is soon to return. And I believe that Jesus Christ is, well, I believe it could be today. Yeah. I believe the Lord could come back before we're, we're finished here with this. Yeah. And that needs to be the heart of, a, of the believer, is always watching and waiting and praying for the Lord's return. But as we're looking at this, Jesus surrendered His will into the Father's will, that His will be done. And as he did so, and as he, as he completely submitted to the Heavenly Father, as he did that, strength was given to him. He rose up off of his knees, and what was lying ahead, the scripture would say in verse 53, Jesus says, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. But then he says this, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Meaning, Jesus is revealing that as these men, as Judas betrayed him with a kiss, he's saying, this hour's been given to you. It is in the Lord's hand. He told Pilate, he says, when Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to kill you or to set you free? <coughs> Jesus, after being silent for so much, he said, there is no power been given unto you except what my heavenly Father has Glory. given to you. Yes. And at that moment, the fear of God struck him, but it wasn't enough to save his soul, but it was enough that he sought to set Jesus free from that moment on of no avail. Uh, but at any rate, Jesus is saying, this hour has been given to you. What you're doing, the betrayal, the, the, the crucifixion, all of this, it is because it has been given to you to be able to fulfill all of this. And you're being, and he reveals who's behind them. He says, the powers of darkness. Yeah. And 
so we understand even from this that Jesus is revealing the agony that he was in in the garden was far more than just the agony of knowing I'm going to be crucified. But it was the agony of knowing the powers of darkness that were at work in the spirit realm behind all of these things. But praise be to God. When Jesus said it is finished and he breathed his last breath and it says he gave up his spirit because it needs to be made known, Jesus said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. When Jesus knew that all had been fulfilled, and he yielded up his spirit, the earth shook, even the Roman soldier says, surely this man is the Son of God. And the Bible tells us in Matthew, that the graves opened, and prophets of old actually were resurrected back to life again, and they, after Jesus' resurrection, walked about and showed themselves around in Jerusalem. That's pretty awesome. As we, as we see all that, when Jesus said it, it was right then, the earth shook, the, the, the veil was torn in two, and Jesus Christ fulfilled all things. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? And it needs to be known. It needs to be known. And I, I told you I'd stop and let you, let you guys say it. Uh, when they put that boulder, or that stone rolled in front of the, 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 the tomb, when they put the watch there, to keep the disciples from stealing the body, God's ultimate plan was to add witnesses upon witnesses that it was impossible that the Jews did not steal his body because there was a Roman guard right there. It was impossible for the, him to just walk out because there was a, a stone put there. It had to have been the Lord Jesus Christ raising from the dead. And that stone was rolled away by the holy angels and the Roman soldiers saw the earthquake, they saw the angels, and they went, and they were paid off to say that the Jews stole the body. But we know differently. Amen? Amen. We saw the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Anybody with anything that you want to share real quick? Comments, questions? Go ahead. Well, with, um, back to the captivity captives, we know that because of the story of Lazarus and the rich man, yeah. that there was a great gulf between them and the no. Right. So we know that there was a place where the Old Testament was saying this, but it wasn't. You guys hear later. Uh, she was saying that the, the parable of the rich man Lazarus shows how, uh, in terms of uh, leading captivity captive, that the rich man died, he went directly to hell. Lazarus, uh, and when you read that, that's not even a parable, because uh, when you read it, Jesus doesn't say it was a parable. I believe there was a real rich man and a real Lazarus at some point in time, and Jesus is referring to the, this story of these two people. And the, the Lazarus went directly to be in Abraham's bosom, is what it is called, in paradise. And Jesus, well, Abraham says it, but Jesus says that there was a great gulf between the two and that they could not interact. So being in Abraham's bosom, is not being in the presence of God in the sense of it. There had, when Jesus is explaining that, the, those Old Testament believers had the promise of not going into the hell that the rich man had. But yet, as according to Hebrews, their promises, they're waiting for them to be completely fulfilled until after the cross of Calvary, and Jesus leads them in. Uh, but even to this day, there are still believers waiting. We're all waiting for the glorified bodies that we're one day going to receive. And prayerfully, when that, when, when the trump sounds and we are the ones that are alive and yet remain, that we will just be a blink of an eye behind all those saints of old that get their glorified body. But they're still waiting for their glorified body. They're waiting for that promise to be, to be done. But right now, they are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, we know that because we don't believe in soul sleep. We know that the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Anybody with anything else? All right, well, let me, let me move on here. And uh, I want to read verse, verse 44. This is Luke 22, 44, and I, I'm almost done. Uh, it says, And being in agony... He prayed more earnestly. And so the points that I wanted to make here tonight 
is number one, the agony that our Lord went through. It was for us. And the agony that he was enduring in Gethsemane was knowing far more than just a, a physical affliction that was going to come upon him. And I know that we've heard of the history of the cat of nine tails in terms of the, the whippings upon Jesus' body. And people say that he was whipped uh, what, 39 times. Uh, you know, and based upon tradition and these types of things with shards of glass and bone. And the, the Bible doesn't actually say any of that. Uh, but when you look at the Old Testament and you read Isaiah 53, when you read of these prophecies uh, you know we tried to picture how what it might have been like but we're going by tradition on some of those things and history on what types of, of whips they used and such but when you read Isaiah 53 when you read the, the Old Testament prophecies it says his visage was so marred he did not look like a man any longer uh, when you read of his beard being plucked out when you read about these types of things, even the victor's crown, I mean, you know, it doesn't tell us how big those thorns were, but history would tell us of types of thorns that grow in Jerusalem at that time and, and the agony of those thorns piercing into his brow. and Our minds cannot even imagine. But whatever, whatever it, however and whatever you, tools they used we know that our Lord was beaten beyond our own ability to comprehend as the Son of God was spit upon I get sick to my stomach when I read of those Roman soldiers who blindfolded the Lord they spit upon him they whacked him with sticks and they said prophesy which one of us did it when I read that I think God, in a moment of a thought, could have vaporized these imbeciles. They had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea who they were messing with. Yet for the love of God, he endured that for me. He knew Lathan was going to need forgiven. He knew the world needed him to endure this. And so he endured not just the, the brutality of it, but he endured the shame. He, he endured the mockery as these pathetic imbeciles of Pharisees laughed at him on the cross. And they said he healed others, but he can't even heal himself. The absolute blasphemy of, of these peons, not even understanding that they're crucifying the God of the universe. It just it breaks my heart the whole time he was thinking of you and me. And yet, this is what our Lord endured. And I want to encourage us, he endured that agony for us. And so you might have an, a Gethsemane, which is like this compared to his, you know, it's minute. But when we're in our own little struggles of life, we can feel like we're in that place. He told the disciples, he said, why do you sleep? He said, pray lest you enter into temptation. Which tells us that when we're praying, that is a communication with the Holy Spirit as we submit to the will of the Father. It will keep us from the, 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 the hour of darkness. It will keep us from the, those, those bad times that we are going to be facing. And I've said it before, and I'm going to say this in closing. I believe America, I believe we the church, and this isn't new. This isn't because of what's in the news, because you can look back and see that I've, I'm not changing my message based upon what the news says but I believe the church is in for some persecution I believe the church is it needs to get ready but the truth is the true church has already been ready because if anything right now is taking the church today by surprise and we're starting to now say we've got to get ready I'm afraid <coughs> I guess I'd want to say, where have you been? Because if last, if 2020 wasn't enough to get get you ready, then what, what are we waiting for? I'm afraid we might be beyond apostasy at that point. But when we're in our Gethsemane, when we're enduring prayer, we've got to find that place of prayer. 
find that place of surrenderment to the Lord. It's been said that in the garden, Jesus found the place of surrenderment. He found the price of surrenderment. And then he found the peace of surrenderment. And I guess I would want to conclude this, this thought with, the, with that. That when we are in our own Gethsemane, we've got to surrender to the, to the Lord, to His will, and allow His peace to then come upon us. Because when we have the peace of God, there's nothing we can't face. When we know that we are in the will of the Father, and that what we are about to encounter, and it would show us that God did not withhold the trial from Jesus. When Jesus said, if this cup can pass, let it, let it pass for me, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus did not, or God did not grant that he did not have to go through it. But he gave the power and the strength to make it through. And three times, the Bible says, Paul asked God to remove the thorn from his flesh. And every single time, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And you and I aren't promised to have every thorn removed from our side. But we are promised that the grace of God will always be sufficient for the trials ahead of us. And the three Hebrew children got thrown into the furnace. But there was a fourth man in the fire. Amen. Daniel, even though he knew the decree, three times a day he still prayed to the Lord. And he was thrown into the lion's den. But the Lord sent his angels to mute the, the mouths of the lions. So we're not promised to not be thrown into the fire, to be tossed into the lion's den. We're not promised that we're not going to have that thorn in the flesh. But we are promised God will be with us every step of the way. And the three Hebrew children said... If he delivers us, we know he's able to. He's able to set us free from the, your, your, your flames. But even if he don't, we still won't bow down. So either way, we're victorious. Amen? Amen. Anybody with any final thoughts or questions?